Hello and welcome to the After Party, conversations with Spy Party players, or in this case, Spy Party developers. Today I'm joined by John Simino and Chris Hecker. Say hello, guys. Hello. Hi, that was John. <laughs> is it the first time he's ever been heard on the internet? I don't know. I think it is. Probably. Yeah, weird. <laughs> three, three voices on the podcast. Um, so, you guys are making a video game. That's what we've been told. <laughs> yes, for quite some time now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> gotta, gotta get the dig in. <laughs> well, it, it's, you know, it's could be seen as good or bad. How long has it been now that you guys have been working together on this project? Together? Let's see, when did you start? I think I started, like, uh, September 2011. That sounds about right. So I was going, so I got laid off September 2009, which is when I went full-time on it. And then it took me a couple of years. That makes sense to convince John to 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 to, um, to leave Maxis and come here. Yeah, I was ready for a change from from EA. So the spy party came up, and it seemed like a, a good opportunity, like a fun project to work on. And let's be clear, his favorite sandwich place is right down the street. So it's right <laughs> down the street from Maxis. So it was an excuse to keep up coming to his favorite sandwich That's place. That's right. <laughs> so it was it was fifty fifty. It was those two motivating factors. <laughs> He really likes the sandwiches there. Let's just put it that way. Plug for Ruby's Cafe. Yeah, Ruby's Cafe in Emeryville. Anyone who lives in the area should try it out. Cool. Um, so uh, where I wanted to, to, to start start with this was, was going back to um, uh, asking about how both of you got into video game development to sort of give us a background as to you know what might have led you to work on on this project and like what motivates you to work in this field at all sure so, you want to go first john yeah since john uh hasn't. yeah i'll go first let's see so i went to college in uh, savannah college of art and design in, in georgia studying animation and uh basically traditional style animation all hand drawn and i uh, didn't really think i was going to go into 3d animation but you know that's just kind of where all the industry went so I was kind of studying a dying art, really. And then uh, my first job was in San Francisco. So I just moved across the country to uh, to work on these Flash cartoons at uh, Mondo Media. Uh, Happy Tree Friends being probably the most famous. Nice. And uh, after that, I just met a lot of cool people. And, and then once that company kind of disbanded, when the internet cra like, uh, crash happened, a lot of them went to EA. So I had a lot of friends here, or at, at EA, not here. But, uh, and... Uh, that's kind of they, they kind of said i should join them and see see if i like you know working on video games i'm like that ah, sounds like fun so i applied i took a like a 3d class and learned maya and uh applied at ea and got the job there and then uh, immediately was I, I was on sims for like a month or two and then it was kind of immediately put on spore which was uh, a game i never really i didn't know what was gonna happen like i never heard the game before but apparently it was kind of already getting some buzz as being this kind of very ambitious crazy thing and uh and I was on that for like five or six years, and it was really fun. Um, that's where I met Chris. He was kind of the the main engineer who tackled like all the hardest problems, like designing the the system that allowed animated uh, allowed us to animate creatures that could look like anything and just make one animation that could work on a whole bunch of different types of guys. So, so we worked well together, and uh, that's how we met. And then he started doing Spy Party, and then I joined him. You shipped uh, Dark Spore after spore right yeah after spore i worked there a little bit longer I, I, we worked on dark spore and some expansion packs and uh so it was kind of like i was doing a lot of alien stuff and it was kind of working on spy party with a bunch of human characters was was very appealing just from working on that other stuff for so long enough space aliens John, John had a funny career, a funny like start to the uh, Ocean, Ocean Quigley, who's the art director of Spore, and I always laugh about John because he first got there, and uh, you know Spore was a completely unreal game project, like it was not like anything else inside EA or in the industry at all, like that right. that much time and everything, and he had started on Sims Three right when they were about to go into crunch, and uh, and then Sims we Sims Two, Sims Two rather, right? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> a long time ago, and uh, so he started on there, and then we scooped him up into Spore because he was he was near us in the office. And we're like, this guy's awesome. Let's scoop him up into Spore. So he totally dodged the bullet of finding out what real real video game development was like. His first job right after <laughs> right when he got into the industry, um, because they then proceeded to crunch like a death march for like a year and a half after right. that or something. Whereas you were on Spore, like, hey, John, can you make this cute creature underneath this thing? So, <laughs> I was unknowingly rescued. I yes. had no idea. <laughs> um, 
but it was great because John and I worked together well, which is not something you can say for me and everyone. I'm a little bit hard to work with, um, but John and I get along well. And so, uh, and my, the tool for the Spore animation system was just insane. And he kept a good, pretty good attitude throughout the whole thing. Um, and so we, <laughs> <laughs> with my torturous, <laughs> torturous tool. And so he, uh, um, so yeah, so it was just clear. And he, you know, I'd seen a bunch of his stuff that was, you know, he, he did a bunch of like animations for Spore, like in Flash and things that uh, were for promo stuff. And they were super awesome. And he did a ton of icons in Spore. Say again? Uh, like like um, pr previous sort of stuff, like mock-ups of designs. For... Yeah, I, I, some of them. Some of them were movies that released, like um, like little flash black. You may have seen one. I don't know if it's online anymore, but like there's like a... yeah. If you Google flash spore film, like you can see it. Yeah, there's a bunch of cool little animated things that just have a lot of character and stuff like that. And so um, you know, when we started working on Spy Party. It was clear, like you know, and, and I knew he liked to do people as well, like. Um, uh just that really stylized and he can do everything you know he can animate and model and and concept and and do icons i mean you did how many icons did you end up doing on spore hundreds oh gosh <laughs> yeah hundreds so uh um and so i knew that uh he's a great person to, i mean he's a phenomenally talented artist and like we can work together and he's multidisciplinary which you basically have to be with indie games like you can't you know in ea you can survive as just an animator like someone gives you a rigged model and you just make it move but that just doesn't work in uh in indie games so so yeah so it took a couple of years to talk him out uh, out of there and into here <laughs> take talk me out of my 401k and health yeah. benefits <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> yep. and uh, but we kept the sandwiches around so that's at least right. one perk <laughs> yeah i mean working on uh an indie game is is good in that way because i get to do a whole, whole bunch of different things so i don't get bored of like if you're animating all the time every day you kind of it can get a little old so it's nice to be able to jump from different disciplines modeling rigging and stuff and yeah. it's funny because like that's actually part of the reason we do the bat the characters in batches of five because you know the set of tools necessary to model the high poly models and then the low poly models and then rig them which means put the skeleton inside and then paint and texture them and then animate them um they're all very complicated tools and you know by the time you're done uh uh and you've moved on to another tool like it's easy to forget like you know it's, it kind of is in your fingers but like you it's easy to like forget so we do them in batches so you can like remember how to use ZBrush and then use it for five characters. <laughs> um, since you guys are doing these in batches, John, have, have you found that uh, your like, skill at this particular problem of uh, uh, modeling and building these sets of Spy Party characters has gotten faster or, or changed as you've done different sets of them? Yeah, I think I've definitely gotten faster as I've gone. Like, like, and you learn new techniques that are make things go quicker. And um, but uh, doing them in, in groups helps speed it up a little bit. Like if I did one all the way through for each one individually, I would have to, you know, it, it would slow it down a lot. So I think we found that doing groups of five was the perfect balance of me working long enough on one thing without getting too bored, but uh, but also not having to re-remember re everything every time. Yeah, I mean, these tools, like, I don't know if you, you, you actually, you, you've used Maya before. I mean, they're just some phenomenally complicated tools. And you're building, you know, when you're building a rig character, you're building this little machine. And so it's like, it's, it, there's so much knowledge that happens in the moment just from each individual stage that five turned out to be a great, like, you know, balance in terms of, like, a cool new you know, chunk of stuff goes into the game. John <laughs> stays sane for, right. <laughs> from doing all the art. And, uh, um, but is, you know, it, it stays in his, the trickiest one. one is going from Maya to ZBrush. That's, uh, like your, your hands actually have to change the hotkey, <laughs> how you remember hotkeys and stuff. And ZBrush is so weird. Oh man, it's yeah. weird. Yeah. So, uh, go going from high, high poly to low poly, what is the process that's required for that, for that transition? Uh, let's see. So usually I modeled the, the hands and the face in ZBrush. Well, I start with like a low poly Maya model and I bring it to ZBrush and then mm -hmm. I add the detail and uh, I do a low poly in Maya of the clothing and I bring that into ZBrush as well. And then I can add in folds and things. So Maya and ZBrush kind of work together. Mainly, I guess mainly I, I model everything in Maya first and then add the detail in ZBrush um, to, to turn that into a, a, a game character. I have to take the low poly uh, models and kind of clean them up for animation basically so that when you're moving stuff around they kind of fold nicely making sure all the uh i don't know the uh just the way it's it's um like fixing making crevices. sure you have enough geometry like yeah the crevices in the mouths and the eyes and the elbows everything can bend and move properly 
And then uh, once I have that, I have to UV it, which means basically I have to take the face, for instance, and flatten it out so that you can project a texture on it and do the same thing for all of the, the clothing and everything. And then uh, once you have that, then you can bake it. So I, I'll bake like an ambient occlusion, which is kind of like the, the shadows and the crevices. And then uh, and also bake just kind of a, a basic light map that uh, so it looks like they're kind of lit from above. And uh, I'll take those as kind of my, my starting textures and uh, and, I'll, and I'll do a lot of paint over on top of those to kind of clean them up and make them look more stylized. And uh, I think once I have that, then that, that's pretty much ready to rig after that. And then it's just a matter of putting in the skeleton and and binding all the weights so that it, he moves as, as naturally as possible. And um, then he should be ready for to animate after that. Wow, and so then you try animating him and then go back and fix it. <laughs> right. And then, I, and then when I first try animating him, I find what I did wrong or what needs tweaking. And then usually I'll, I'll test it out with a walk and some talking and then I'll find all the problems. And, and then once that's cleared up, then usually all the rest of the animations go pretty smoothly hmm. yeah it, it's um it certainly sounds like a, a lot of uh a lot of preparatory work to make sure that the, the the build of the character is working i come all from um doing 2d animation where uh everything is a facade so you don't have to worry about any like physical properties of how the frame is is working yeah so. that's why i got into 2d animation in the first place because i wasn't great with computers probably still not but uh you've gotten a lot better i've gotten a lot better but uh but yeah when you're doing 2d i mean you just draw it right as mm -hmm. long as you can draw it it's fine <laughs> but in 3d it does help because once you build it you know you don't have to worry about getting all the you know keeping the proportions and all that that's all set for you which is nice but and it's easier to tweak and edit a, an animation later whereas in hand drawn i always had to like you know just start over throw mm -hmm. throw paper away and stuff the uh it, it, the complexity of the of the pipeline he was just talking about gets to why um even though it'd be cool it's not clear we're going to be able to support like modded characters you know we'll do levels because those are static and easy but like it's hard to imagine and he didn't even get into all the animation constraints like how you hook up the ik and like when attachments to drinks and stuff like that happen there's a whole bunch of additional stuff that happens during the uh animations and so it's not that it's there's it's not that we don't wouldn't want characters to be done by fans. It's just so much work. I mean, it's like an incredible amount of you know little nitpicky stuff to get it to work right and not blow up. And so maybe eventually, but it would be a lot harder for us to allow that just because all the hooks we'd have to like we'd have to teach people how to do it, and it's just an an insane process we've developed over the entire time he's been here, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, uh, perhaps one thing that might work is just having like uh, people allowed to make edited variants of existing models because you're going to have a pretty diverse range of uh, models and animation yeah. sets anyway so you could just perhaps yeah. do that it, and you can imagine clothes yeah. like if uh, you know it's something like that that if it was like uh, the same skeleton and the same you know um and they took the existing mesh and kind of used its weights and stuff you could imagine something like that happening it's just it's 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 even that is like you know just getting things weighted correctly so that it doesn't you know work so that it works it's just, it's, just, it's significantly more work than a level so we're gonna start with levels and see yeah. how that goes um i mean it's a you know never underestimate the power of fans on the internet to do cool stuff though so who knows maybe someone will like reverse engineer all the formats and figure out how to make it work that'll be nuts <laughs> maybe maybe yeah um so so there are a few different subjects I've, i want to talk about because spy party is a very inter very interesting game um uh and we haven't had a chance to talk talk with you guys yet um so I, I guess where I want to start was talking about how uh, Spy Party relates to this idea of uh, games that are about people or games that are about uh, human level interaction, because that seems like right. something that's sort of growing growing in popularity maybe um, in in the indie scene, or, or perhaps I'm just imagining that. But games like um, uh, Gone Home or Papers Please, uh, game, games that are about um, human scale interaction. Uh, seem to be very engaging and drawing an audience. Um, and I was wondering if you guys had any had any thoughts about uh, how this might be uh, cha changing uh, uh, both potential audiences for games and also just like bro broadening um, uh, uh, what sort of forms of en entertainment games can provide. 
Right. I mean, I definitely think it's true that there are more games about normal people nowadays um, than there used to be, and that's great. I mean, the games you listed in there's like Cart Life and mm -hmm. and you know all, all just a whole bunch of other games about people who don't have you know space armor and and and, and swords. Um, uh, and it was interesting when John was saying one of the reasons that he was interested in Spy Party is because it's about people. You know, it's a different kind of game than he was working on games that had a lot of like you know monstery kind of guys and stuff like that and and armor and you know all that stuff. Um, uh, we still have a long way to go. I mean, the, you know, if you look at the number of TV shows about normal people um, versus the number of games about normal people, it's a, quite a gap. Um, if you assume that a mature medium like television is kind of, uh, you know, shows, you know, the kind of mix that uh, that people are interested in, um, you know, as a whole. Uh, but but I mean, I'm still it's been a great, you know, the last last couple of years have been really great for this. And I think Spy Party fits right in with that. Um, I mean, it's a fantastical situation like, you know, there's a sniper rifle and, you know, a weird, you know, stylish party and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, like it's about these relatively mundane, small things. And it's the combination of them and the mechanics that that make it interesting as a game. Um, uh, so, yeah, no, I, de I definitely think that's true. I mean, uh, the. It'll, it'll be interesting to see if, if John is at the end of Spy Party sick of doing people and wants to go back to orcs. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's not really no, anything. I don't think so. People are the most interesting thing, right? I mean, right. In, in a lot of ways, like, you know, the, the, um, you know, you live your life presumably surrounded by people and like, you know, flirting with them or you're getting in fights with them or whatever. And I just think that's an interesting thing. And I wish more games, um, took, uh, Took them as a subject matter and i think it is changing i think it, i think that is and i think that's great i mean i'm glad we can um i mean like it, you know i always talk about you know we add drinks or something like that and it's a it's a big pain in the butt on the on the production side like john's got to do all these you know we're, we just discussed the other day like okay you know the listen animations when there's a drink in their hand stomp the drink arm so a lot of the things he wants to do that are kind of expressive in the talks of the listens don't look right because one arm's not moving. So should we do separate versions that have drinks and things like that? So there's production uh, stuff associated with that. But drinks add a lot, you know, to the game already, and they're not even hooked up to a mission yet. So, Well, they, um, they kind of are, right, with fingerprint and purloin? But not to the mission right, that yeah, you I mean, that's, that's relatively recent. It, it, when they first came in, they were still interesting gameplay without actually even having a mission, yeah. And, and once Poison Drink goes in, that'll be, you know, it'll be even more of a, so you'll be able to fingerprint them or Poison Drink or, you know... Um, uh, or purloin, um, which is, you know, uh, all surrounding drinks. But yeah, but I mean, so we talk about that. So we're going to, you know, because we like the, you know, drinks are a cool part of being at a party. Like we're going to do this thing that allows him to branch the animations based on whether there are drinks or not. Um, so that we can get more variety that way. And, you know, it's like right now, if you look, if you look closely, we've got animations where someone crosses their arms you know, uh, but if there's no drink in their hand, then they kind of just hold one arm in front of their body. Right. Yeah. So, you know, we have to fix stuff like that. Um, but it's totally worth it because it's just cool. Like, I would like to add lighting cigarettes. I think that'd be a really cool, you know, cigarettes as a, as a kind of similar thing. I mean, I don't know what that's going to do or do to our ratings because they don't seem to like alcohol and cigarettes. <laughs> you, know, you can blow somebody's head right off. <laughs> they don't have anyone light a cigarette. Oh, my gosh. Um, but that'll be interesting from an animation standpoint as well. Yeah. If you had anything yeah. to say about drinks, John. Huh. Besides their opinion, your bud. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I just noticed that when we first, when I was animating the listens and stuff, I wasn't really thinking about them holding drinks as I was doing it. And then seeing them in game, I was like, oh, wow, yeah, I need to, we need a whole different set where they're holding them versus not and stuff like that. So that happens a lot when you start layering, layering things on top of each other. Yeah, and in fact, we've tried to do as little of that as possible because Spore was all about proceduralism and like things blending on top of each other. And we both got kind of sick of that by the end of that because you want the control. So the more per frame control you have, the better you can get their quality. Um, and so we're probably going to end up having three different kinds of animations, animations that can have blink drinks on them or not. Um, you know, it doesn't affect the animation that much, like if one hand's gesturing and the other doesn't matter. Ones that are uh, played when there's a drink. Um, you know, so you know, so he knows that this hand has the drink in it, and so it can gesture with that hand in a slighter way or do whatever it needs to do. And one that he knows there's no drink, so he can do like you know, rubbing hands together or you know, cross crossing arms or that kind of thing. Mm. Yeah, are, are there um, are there technical? So I I mean, you 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 Chris, your background uh, in games has involved a lot of stuff to do with animation. Um, are there technical problems or like limitations in our current technology we have for animating 3d characters in a video game that you've sort of like come up against in developing spy party like pro unsolved problems 
Well, there's tons of like, there's tons of, there's, I mean, sure. But we just choose not to kind of attack those. You know, like Spore <laughs> tried to attack a bunch of crazy unsolved problems, whereas we're trying to trying to limit the things and you know do things that we can control the quality on. But for example, I mean that drink thing is an example. Like another example is outros. Like I would like to have you be able to you know right now you have to wait until you go. He has to you know John has to animate things from a rest pose for basically all blends, right? And in fact, it's become gameplay. Whereas if you if you don't finish your listen animation in certain circumstances and go back to your rest pose, you can get you know they know that you're the spy if they're look paying really close attention um and so there's a certain you know there, there's there's techniques for doing you know there's researchy techniques um uh for uh um called motion graphs and things like that that to, to try and make for multiple blend out points so he doesn't have to hard code all of these blend points in there um but we're trying to take a very i mean because we're doing this just by ourselves and there's not a huge team like on spore i just did animation you know um once i was on the animation system full time uh whereas in spy party like you know i've got to like do the marketing and the, the thing and you know it's all of this stuff so we're trying to like we're, we, we we're constantly trying to find the like knee of the curve in terms of complexity versus quality for so for example he actually kind of tangentially mentioned this when he was talking about the pipeline like we bake all the lighting into the characters there's no dynamic lighting on the characters right now on the new art characters um we're probably going to do a thing uh to 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 allow like um them to change lighting slightly as they move around the party but in a very like one lighting sample per character type thing so we're not doing any kind of physically based lighting or anything john we make it all look good by eye you know um because you know parties are all bright usually brightly lit you know like you know indoor scenes with lots of diffuse light diff, you know lots of light sources so there's no real hard shadows and things like that but that's a perfect example of where we're at this like local maxima like we have these textures and he you know slaves over the lighting and stuff in maya and in photoshop to get the exact thing and then we bake it all in there so you know, a spotlight coming on in Spy Party wouldn't look right, for example. But we just, we, we, you know, we're not going to do that kind of thing. So we, we, we try and choose our battles. Um, so the animation outro thing is a good battle, perhaps, to choose just because that's a big integral part of the game. Like the animations, you know, how the animations, you know, go from one animation to the other and what which things are tells when people can leave conversations and things like that. So, but I know it, it, it could shift the way it currently is as well. Um, um, since it obviously works, but I think that it needs a little bit of a spy buff to not have people get shot for, you know, for exactly not hitting this, the end of the animation. But so no, so we have to, we try not to bite off real research problems because we're re technical research problems because we're already biting off a big game design research problem, which is does this game mechanic work, you know. I mean, it seems to now, but it's a pretty experimental game, and so we want to spend our re research luck points <laughs> there. <laughs> Yeah, it's a good point, and it it's interesting as you say that um, uh, for this particular game, you're being aware of what te technical challenges does it actually even uh, need to confront, and which ones can you just avoid. That point you brought up of hey, we actually don't need to um, have a lighting solution because none of the characters are going to move out of the lit area, so that that's like right. something you get for free. Yeah, exactly. And we'll do you know we'll do we'll do wacky things like you know the dog in the purse was a big pain in the butt, but that was just cool. So like it's you know the things that have a big payoff is like that's not exactly a technical problem, but we'll like bite off a little bit more you know. Um, or like but, a Miss H's hair. Yes, exactly. Like okay, we got to optimize the render now because she's got too much hair, <laughs> but it was worth it because it's just amazing, right? So. Um, or the wheelchair is another example with the pathing. Like once that's you know once that gets in there, making sure that's going to work correctly and stuff, there'll be a little extra code associated with that. Um, but for the most part, I wanted to you know we want to spend those where they pay off in terms of the game mechanics. Mm -hmm. No, it, it's also interesting. Um, uh, this this sort of brings up something that's interesting to to me at least. This idea of um, uh, how Spy Party relates to the dilemma, the sort of problem in video games of abstraction versus representation like how stylization is this important ingredient that i wish a lot more 3d video games would use where you're obviously representing something on the screen of a character animating but because you're using stylization suddenly all of the like weird uh, uh, glitches and abstractions of the rules are a lot easier to to digest for the player and that, that that's something that the team is uh, really interesting to me. That this idea that all all of the like, you know, bro brokenness for um for better word, word uh, for better, 
better choice of words, um, in Spy Party doesn't sort of break you out of the experience at all. It all like feels um, not not natural, but like um, uh, you you know what I mean. You you can accept uh, things that are happening in the game that aren't real because of the stylization. Whereas if Spy Party were a realistic looking game, I feel like a lot of it wouldn't wouldn't work. Right. Uh, John's phone has a really absurd ringtone in the <laughs> background, sorry. and we're wondering whether that showed up is going to show up in the, in the MP3. I'll be fine. The, well, I think there's two different things you're talking about, and I'll 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 I'll, I'll talk to one, and, and John can talk to the other. So the first the first thing was um, there's like the there's like you know when animations are like not blending right or like the little like weird pathing things and things like that. Um, those kinds of like. Um, things that end up working okay in the game as it is. And so I'll talk about that. And then we have John talk about like the stylization of the actual art, like the illustrative right. thing and like how, how we chose to try and avoid the uncanny valley and like, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so for the former, for the first one, like, yeah, I mean, the fact that the spy is trying to blend in and as long as I make sure the spy and the NPCs have the same bugs, um, then it's fine. Like the game kind of self adjusts. Like I hope to improve the quality of like the walking and the blending and all of that stuff. And, you know, really like make, I mean, John does these amazing animations and then I kind of throw them in a blender and they get all messed up. So I hope to like expose those more. Um, but, uh, but yeah, he's <laughs> going to get the phone. Um, but uh, um, so I hope to, uh, I hope to, um, I, I want to make improvements, but the nice thing about the game design is it doesn't need improvements to work as a game design. Like, I mean, the old art shows that, right? Like, it works with really ugly, broken art as well as because as well as new art, you know, beautiful art because of the way um, because of the way the mechanic is set up. So the spy is trying to blend in, you know, and you're kind of like looking really carefully for certain small things, um, some of which can be robotic, weird computery things, and some of which can be like you know behavioral level stuff. As far as the stylization, yeah, we've spent a long time before we revealed the first characters picking the style. You want to talk about that a little bit? Uh, yeah, you mentioned like the Uncanny Valley. I think that's kind of what you were talking about. Is uh, if uh, basically Uncanny Valley is if if as a character starts to get more close to realistic. If you get too close, it starts to get creepy, basically. Mm. And uh, so, if if you like have like a Pixar style, it's a little bit easier to digest. Whereas if it's more like Polar Express, yeah, it starts to get a little weird looking. So uh, for my style, I've always kind of enjoyed kind of the the Pixar type look. So this game, I've actually tried to push it more towards realistic, which has been interesting for me, just kind of getting more naturalistic. And uh, it's still most people would say very stylized to me i'm like wow these things are like photo real because yeah. <laughs> i'm used to doing more of like a, a cartoony thing but uh but yeah so it helps definitely sell the animations and, and just make it feel more it's just easier to look at when it's stylized and hopefully you know just cooler looking too yeah i mean it, it's it's funny early on we had these big like uh you know, I'm pulling John. I mean, I, you know, we did a bunch of different studies of different kinds of characters, and uh, which someday we'll will re reveal uh, in the art book or something like that. But um, but uh, all the way from a uh, you know very caricatured style to, to to a more realistic style, and this kind of like you know meeting this like for him, it's not the middle because he's pulled him more towards a realism thing. But anyone you know uh, would look at it and go like, oh, these are clearly stylized. You know, so that's why we chose the word illustrative because it's not they're not realistic, um, but they're also not cartoons in some sense. So. Um, um, I think it works really well. Like um, it allows us to do things like not lighting them realistically, right? Like when it's a car cartoon, you're not expecting like this perfect, you know, uh, every pore in your skin is, is is lit correctly. And so we can get away with a lot of that stuff by choosing the kind of aesthetic that we did. Um, it's interesting though, a topic we could talk about a little bit is the, is the remember the, when we revealed the, the level aesthetic with the warm cool interiors and stuff like that if you look at that versus the stuff we're doing now like pub the latest it's still got the warm cool inside outside thing but there's a lot more detail and a lot more color if you go back and compare it to something like modern so we're going to actually go back and touch those levels with the new kind of more evolved level aesthetic at some point yeah it is is that something that um uh you guys have gotten much, much feedback on of like how the warm cool separation has worked in the new levels so far like do 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 you think that's working the, the yeah i mean people people seem to like the, the the i mean it's clear where you can walk it's clear where you can't it's clear where the action is and that's the main thing most people yeah. um uh most people actually haven't really noticed the difference between the old uh we actually didn't even 
noticed it was happening as we did modern and then high, you know, as we did modern and then did high rise and then did uh, pub. And then you kind of go back and you're like, wow, it's so monochromatic, the modern, you know? And so that's why we're going to go back and, and, and bring it all up to the current color thing. But I mean, we, I don't know if you want to say anything about that. Yeah. I think when we first did modern, we were coming from kind of the old art, which was just all gray. Yeah. So it felt like, oh, there's a lot of color now, yeah. but, but now that we've done the other, the, the pub, for instance, there's a lot of color in that comparatively. And it makes the other one look a little bit too simple almost. Yeah, so I want to I want to add some variety. It's a little bit hard to look at all that yellow, I think. So we want to break it up. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So expect that expect that at some point to look more pub level density and color choices and things. And not the not the exact colors, but the 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 variations around warm and cool and kind of variety of stuff in them. It's it'll, kind of richer. Yeah, it'll change, but I guess as you um, put in colored bookcases and paintings, like that will probably change it. Yeah, but I mean the drinks. I mean, you can look at the bar behind. I mean, a perfect yeah. A-B test is the bar behind in Modern and the bar in Pub are just completely different looking, you know, yeah. um, in terms of like, you know, one you one looks like it looked great in the renders when we did the initial thing, especially since no one had seen the new art. I mean, it just looked, you know, beautiful. But it looks very plain now compared to something like Pub, which has this richness, but still retains the kind of inside outside vibe. You know, you look down the street and it's much cooler down there. Right, and there's also the you want you want the characters to pop out too. Yeah. So there's a balance there because if if it gets too cluttered and too colorful, then the characters kind of will blend in a little too much, and it's harder to tell them apart. Yeah, totally. Right. So you can play with saturation and color and and uh, you know view, value and stuff like that. That's um uh, an an interesting design challenge. I I assume for, for this game, as you uh, talked about, Chris, this is very untested design. Um, for for John, I'm I'm interested to know like. Uh, since this is an un untested uh, sort of game in, in terms of art, like, have you had to relearn or develop a new sort of uh, art aesthetic that works with the gameplay? Like, I, I, I can imagine for animation this is a really big problem of suddenly the uh, obfuscation of an animation is like a design decision that you have to now consider. Yeah, that is true. I mean, um, there's still going to be a lot of back and forth on tweaking animations for gameplay but i try to basically get if it's if it's really gameplay heavy animation i try to make it pretty simple and 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 work with what's already working um if it's something like a, a talk animation i have more leeway because it doesn't really matter kind of as long as it's a similar length i can kind of get away with doing a lot of different things i think the main difference for me in this making this game versus other stuff is just the amount of reference i have to use because they're they're very naturalistic characters so trying to make them look not make them not look too cartoony make them look pretty real i have to really kind of study reference stuff more than even normally which i find is good it, like it's helped me become a better animator just really noticing little tiny details yeah it's amazing how one of the things you realized early on that i thought was fascinating is how fast people move like their hands and their mouth and stuff like you know normally if you're doing an animation you know, you'll like stretch that out over a few frames and they'll just be these massive movements in, in one single frame, you know, using yeah. video reference. When you first start out animating, you tend to kind of make the animation slow and swimmy, like you're underwater or something. But uh, if you actually study real film of people moving, they're just like zipping around like in one frame. And uh, so noticing things like that when you're really trying to make things look more naturalistic was, uh, was good for me, I think. Yeah, and when you started paying attention to that and doing that like the animations like sold themselves so much better yeah, instantly it, was, it made it was a good. huge difference it was good because normally you'd be like there's no way this is moving that far in 124th of a second <laughs> and then yet you do it and it's like pow instantly like believable right and it, it it's something that is um uh sort of i guess can i, can I say using the right word um it it's like visually pleasing as like a, a sniper player to have these like small things you can catch that are moving at like a not a, not a, a, a fraction of a second, but like it, it, it feels satisfying to catch a motion just as it's happened. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the more, the more like kind of uh, uh, naturalistic that these things can get, the more your kind of hindbrain processing happens, and you can see things out of the corner of your eye and just like process. Oh, that's talking, or that's whatever, as opposed to like things that are more abstracted, like a cartoony thing where you have to like look at it for a second or whatever. You know. Um, there's just a lot of processing that goes on that you just recognize, you know, when things look right. And so getting things right at that level, I think is, uh, it just has a lot of payoffs from a perceptual standpoint. Hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested um, to see how, how that's going to happen on, on the player side. Cause I don't know if you've heard this, but like I've had lots, um, lots of people coming to the show, like debating about 
um, the the difference in noticeability of uh, of a talk animation between old art and new art. Um, and the thing I'm yeah. sort of in- interested to see is like whether that'll be something where just over time people will have more like uh, I, I guess of a like stored catalog of what animate talk animations look like for the new characters so that they'll be able to more easily recognize them. I'm hoping that's uh... right. And I, I mean, I, I've been following all that stuff and we just haven't gone, like John said, we're going to do a lot more back and forth. Once we start tuning the animations, we're just trying to get everything in first. Um, so we'll kind of make a more intelligent judgment about that later, but I've been in- very interestedly watching the threads about that. You know, some people are like, this is a disaster. It cannot stand. And other people are like, actually it works pretty well. You know? So it's like, it's always fun when you're making a competitive game to watch the good players debate uh, what works and what doesn't. Mm. This feels like kind of a good consequence of, um, uh, I mean, I'm sure it's hard as hell, but um, uh, you guys being a small development team, you can't make fast changes. And so you kind of have to let things uh, sit and play out, which is maybe good well, for I think, balance. Yeah, I mean, I think you in a, in a situation like that, you don't want to make a fast change. Like, you know, you want to see how it shakes out. I mean, you don't want to break the game. If something's broken, I fix it, you know, immediately. But like, if it's something that's like, oh, you know, I'll have an instinct about what I think is happening and then, you know, put it out there and we'll see what's happening. And sometimes my instinct's right and sometimes it's wrong, but you need a little time, you know, I mean, you know, um, people's, even elite players' instincts are often wrong about about things once they, you know, get actually more time with it. So, um, so yeah, you want to be a little patient on tuning things like that. If you start just react, being totally reactive to every forum post, you'd like, I mean, you're going to just spin out and, uh, and not ever stabilize, you know, and, and actually get good data. Mm. We yeah. should probably wrap up this one. Yeah, no, no, no problem. I, I, I was going to come to the to the last question. Um, so, this has and been feel, like feel, a very feel, feel feel free to feel free to cut me saying we should wrap up soon. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that, that's, Once you edit. that is a fair point. Um, so as as you've said, this has been a long development uh, process so far, and there's no end in near view. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not not uh, you know. It's good. Um, but yeah, so, uh, like, is is burnout a concern for, for, for either of you? Like, how do you take care of yourselves and make sure that you're um, staying healthy and emotionally balanced when working on a huge project? Well, I talked about this a little bit in that, that you know, Spy Party WTF video, and I think that... Um, John's got a pretty health, healthy work attitude. Like he works nine to five. I mean, not nine to five, he works 10 to six, 30 or whatever. And like, you know, he'll crunch and stuff, but, but he's not working weekends that much. And like, he stays pretty, he's got a good separation between work. Whereas I work whenever I probably at a less efficient level than he does, but I work, you know, like, Oh, it's Saturday night at 10 PM. I'll work, you know, or whatever. So, um, but I'm lucky in that I don't really, I mean, you know, uh, I don't really fatigue that much on that side. I'm not bored with the game. Um, and I don't foresee being bored with the game. So, um, uh, but yeah, I don't know if you want to say anything about that. Uh, yeah, well, I think we talked about it a little bit before just how I, I switch my role as an artist a lot. So that helps. So it's like if I'm working on the pub for a month, that's a totally different type of job than animating or rigging or modeling characters. So there, it, it, it's constantly it feels like a new job, like every couple months, basically. So that helps with fatigue a lot. Yeah, that's true. I, yeah, that's a really good point. The, the, when he was working on the pub because he had just, just done a ton of animations right before the pub, and then he uh, he's like, "Oh man, this this level editing is awesome. I, mean, I love making this level. We should get somebody else to do the animations." I'm like, wait, 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 no, that's not how this works at all. <laughs> yeah, I found out actually like modeling a lot. Who knew? <laughs> okay, that, that's good to hear. Um, do you, do you, um uh, do do either of you have ever like? form of exercise that uses relief from uh, work at a computer? Well, I rock climb um, and John plays Hearthstone on the treadmill. (laughs) (laughs) That's one method. Yes. And I (laughs) hang out with friends and drink. (laughs) Yes. He has a pretty active social life. He's very he's he's a huge basketball fan, and our basketball team, the Golden State Warriors, are in the playoffs and are kicking butt. Yeah. And so I get basically our lunches consist of because I know nothing about sports at all. So basically, he tells me all about the basketball world during during lunch. It's funny when I talk to him about sports, he analyzes it like it's a video game and <laughs> the design of the game, the sport. Well, I'm fascinated. Like he told me they like <laughs> move, have moved the three point line in basketball back. A number of times because the people are getting too good at three-point shots and how the game's evolving so it's awesome it's super cool <laughs> well that 
that's interesting in, in, in the sense that uh, so they haven't over time changed the size of the field given that no, they added a thing called the three-point line back in the, what, 70s? Something like that? Yeah, so early 80s, late yeah. 70s, something. And then uh, they added a couple things to tune the game. The shot clock, you had to shoot within a certain amount of time or you forfeit the ball. Right. And then there were three-point line. And then, but people have gotten really good at shooting three pointers like in fact if i may drop some names steph curry on the golden state warriors john's just like very nice yes uh is a phenomenal uh who uh, just would, won mvp today yes, yes very nice. Uh, he's a phenomenal uh three-point shot and he made like 77 in a row at practice the other day or something yeah see how much a basketball expert i am um yeah and so uh so he's just kind of like a a, a wonderkin but like so you know as as three points as the three-point shots became more and more uh, unbalanced they just i guess move the line back a little bit each time yeah to try and balance the game which is really interesting mm. um and hey it's a game design you know they they uh they balance it as they go it's a competitive multiplayer game what are you <laughs> gonna do you got a patch <laughs> mm. needs to change over time awesome all right well thanks to both of you for for taking part in this interview um especially after work i know that's uh, yeah. perhaps more tired than you want to be no, we're good. We're, we're, we're good. This is the end of our workday, so it's perfect. It's perfect timing. I, I'd like to thank John for participating. Yes, yeah. thank you, John. He, uh, <laughs> You're I, very I, welcome. <laughs> um, he's a little shy, but actually, uh, in person, he's not shy at all. Just in terms of like, I was like, John, you should stream your development sometime. He's like, no way. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Having people watch me work sounds like torture, but yes. <laughs> uh, but, but it did great. And uh, yeah, and thanks a ton for doing the podcast series. It's really fun. Yeah, no, no, no problem. It's um, uh, it 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 seems to be something that's like of some some value value to the community, and it, um, totally. Yeah, I I mean like my my main concern um, uh, has been like whether it's only going to be like experienced players who want to take part. But um, just the the other week I had a uh, Top Shack, a new player who was interested in taking part. So it, it it seems like it's more just dependent on the person as to whether they want yeah to, want to hop on and talk about the game no and early early on you had a bunch of uh, 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 beginning players which I think is cool I mean yeah just I mean just keep mixing it up and, and trying different things and that's great yeah awesome okay all well right. thanks all right well take care guys all right take care talk to you soon thanks <laughs>